two verses up there, Ecclesiastes, turn there, Ecclesiastes 7. And I, I told this brother I'd tell a story. Um, uh, just how, thing, how God works things out. And I've got all kinds of stories on how God worked things out. We actually got kicked out of Walmart parking lot last night. We stopped, we, we left after church. And uh, I told Lisa, I said, we'll drive until, you know, maybe I get tired. I was thinking maybe I'd make it to uh, Joplin. But uh, I said, you know, I know there's a Walmart right on the west side of Springfield. It's right off the highway. I said, we'll just pull in there. We had to go inside, grab a few things. And I said, we'll just park there for the night. Walmart lets you park, you know, all over the country. We've parked our RV in parking lots all over the, all over the country. And uh, never had a problem. So we went in, did our shopping last night, came back out to the RV and uh, got in it and put all of our stuff away and uh, cleaned up a little bit, put our pajamas on, crawled in bed and uh, ready to go to sleep. The next thing I know, I hear a <laughs> on my window right next to my bed. And I'm going, who's out there? And I wasn't smart enough. I, well... I say I wasn't smart enough. I should have grabbed my gun, but I'm really glad I didn't because it was a security guy. And I went to the door, and I, I got long-legged pajamas on, you know, long sleeve shirt on. And I opened the door. I could see the lights out there, and I'm going, it's the police or somebody, and I bet we're going to get run off. And he said, sir, we don't allow anybody to stay overnight here. I'm sorry about that. He said, but if you drive two minutes down the road, you go down here to Hobby Lobby, and they'll let you stay all you want to. Okay, Lisa said, what they want? I said, stay in bed. I'm going to drive down the road two minutes. I'm in my pajamas taking our bus down two minutes down the road to a Hobby Lobby, and we pulled in there and we parked. Now, we went on vacation a couple years. I said all that to say this. We went on vacation a couple years ago. And the first, we left just like we did yesterday. We left after church, and we drove all the way from where we live on the other side of Missouri, just south of St. Louis, we drove all the way through Missouri, and we got to Joplin. I, was, I had made up my mind I was going to stop at Joplin. I wanted to see the town after that tornado had blown it apart. I've been there many times. So we pulled into Walmart there, and uh, we, had, we had this motor coach out here. And, uh, of course, we went in, bought a few things, and, and come back out, and we're getting everything settled. And I'm outside putting something away underneath I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I saw a car that was parked just not too far from us and a guy down in there digging through the back seat doing something. Next thing I know, he's up behind me. And I'm like, where's my toolbox? I'm going to grab a crescent wrench or something like that. You just never know. But anyway, this guy came up to me and he said, sir, and he kept his distance. He said, sir, he said, uh, I, can I ask you to do something? He said, um, our car, he said, we're stuck here. He said, my car needs a part. I checked with the auto parts place here, just not too far from here. I think he said it, he needed like $50. He had most of the money, but he was $50 short. And he said, could I get some help from you? Now, I'd sent a text to my wife, and I said, send our son out here. I didn't want to be alone. And uh, I was going to lie. And God said, no, you're not. So I said, sir, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm, I'm missing something here. And I was just fixing to go back inside. And I was. I said, I don't carry cash on me. But I'll tell you what, I'll go in there. I'll get what I want. And I'll use my card. And I'll, I'll bring you out what you need. He said, I really appreciate that. So I did. I went inside and bought some. It was some I don't know, probably didn't cost me 10 bucks. God laid it on my heart, and I withdrew $100. And I walked outside, walked over to the car, and I handed him his 20s. And I said, that should be enough for your part, and you get you something to eat, too. And at that time, I saw that he had a girl. There was a woman in the front seat of the car, and the front door was open. And he just looked at that. And he said, I don't know what to say, but thank you. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, don't thank me. Thank the Lord. 
I said, because he put us together, and, and I, didn't, I didn't have any business cards on me or nothing. But I said, I'll tell you what you do. I said, go to YouTube, and I said, I want you to remember my name, Mike Hoggard. Just go to YouTube and type in Mike Hoggard. That girl jumped out of that car, and she said, I know who you are. We watch your UFO videos. We've seen your videos on YouTube. Now, had I told that guy off and told him I didn't have anything for him, when they would have seen me on YouTube the next time, what would they have thought? You never know. If you, I have no idea but what they could have been angels unawares. And we're commanded. We're not asked to entertain them. We're commanded to entertain them. Strangers. For they might be angels unaware. Amen. I sing about the, the living water. And I'll tell you what that living water is. Paul explains it in Ephesians chapter 5. Is that Christ has washed his body, the church, with the water by the word of God. When that woman came to the well seeking water, she didn't know that she was talking to the word of God himself at that time. Until she got done talking to him and then she said, We've, I just found the guy, I just found the man prophesied in the Bible. I just found him. And she was, and God forgave her of every sin she had ever committed. And the living water went in her and I believe that we'll see her in heaven. Because once the word is in there, you never get thirsty for anything else. Somebody say amen. 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 Uh, you got your Bible open there, Ecclesiastes chapter 7? Or I should say, this is the 666th chapter of the Bible. Now, if you want to write that in your Bible, you can make, write that in your Bible. You just make a note on a notebook somewhere. This is 600. Because I went one day, God taught me to count things in the Bible. Now, I'm not a mathematician. I hated math. I didn't think I was good at it. I, I, I didn't like algebra, but I took it and I passed it. And past algebra, I didn't, I didn't take anything and take trigonometry, calculus, nothing like that. I was done with it forever. Did a college business math and that was about it. And then God started laying on my heart about studying prophecy. Back in 1997, God just, in November 97, God said, Mike, we're going to study prophecy. And I thought, wow, that's great. I'm going to go buy some prophecy books. And God said, don't you dare. I wrote a book on prophecy. And I went, that's pretty neat. He did. He wrote the Bible. It's a sure word of prophecy. And it's like an awakening to me. I mean, I've been to two different Bible colleges. I've been in church all my life. And here in one day, God opened up the book to me and said, it's got truth in it. And now... I don't need the book learning I got from Bible college. What I need is the book. And so I said, God, where do you want me to start reading? Revelation or Daniel? Those are the two prophecy books, right? He said, no, just start reading. And so I did. I spent time reading, 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 studying. God would direct me here. God would start doing this. He would take things out of the Old Testament and he'd tie them in with the New Testament. That's how it's supposed to be. Isaiah said, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail and none shall want her mate. And if you find a doctrine in the New Testament, I guarantee you it's mated to a story, a prophecy, or something in the Old Testament. They just join together like husband and wife. Somebody say amen. That's just how it is. God started showing me that. And then he said, I want you to study numbers. And I said, oh, time out. I'm not doing that. That's numerology. That's the occult. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that stuff. And God said, well, just think about it, Mike. Think about the number seven for a minute. And I thought about it and I said, well, yeah, I guess it does mean something. And I had a couple books, uh, people had given me one was by E.W. Bullinger. It's on Bible numbers written about a hundred years ago. And then there was another one written by a, a Baptist evangelist. He's now gone on to be with the Lord, Ed Below. 
and it was Bible mathematics, and I read both of those books because I wanted to know what the numbers meant. And so I read those books, and I looked at their list of the numbers and what they said they meant, and I, I got done, and I said, God, that's good. That's, that's, that's a, a base of knowledge, but God, I want to know from you what the numbers mean. Maybe these guys are wrong. Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm, I'm a man. I'm capable of not telling the truth 100% of the time. So anything that I say to you tonight, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, you make sure that I'm sticking with the Word of God because God is never wrong and I am. Just ask that pretty lady that's sitting on the back row back there. How many times a day I'm wrong? Go ahead, ask her. She'll say every time. Uh, so I started studying numbers in the Bible. And then I found something. I'll tell you what I found in a minute. Okay? But we're going to have some fun tonight. And I'm going to ask you in a minute to give me a number out of the Scriptures. Okay? I'm going to, I'm going to ask you. You're going to direct part of the service tonight. All right? So I told you we was going to have fun. Ecclesiastes 7. There has to be a reason why we do what we do, and there's a reason why we believe what we believe. And if what we believe doesn't come directly from the Scriptures, then we shouldn't believe it. Amen? If it's in our, I don't care if it's in our doctrinal statement. I don't care if this is how we've always done it. If how we've always done it is not scriptural or against Scripture, then we need to stop doing it and just stick with the Bible. Amen? Amen. And that's where most of the churches of Fort Smith, Arkansas are going wrong. Can I say that? Most of them are going wrong because they are walking away from the Word of God. Now, when I say Word of God, I mean the 1611 King James Bible. The only one, and I'll prove it to you tonight. I will, I will prove it to you tonight. Numbers do not lie. Ecclesiastes 7.25 Solomon said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom. And I said, Lord, that's what I want. I want wisdom. And I was looking in this chapter because I thought maybe I might find the name of the Antichrist. 666 chapter, right? I thought, I'll know it before anybody else does. Well, I didn't find it. But I read, I kept reading. And to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And then he says in verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher. You know who the preacher is? It ain't me. It wasn't Solomon. It's Jesus. He's the preacher, amen? I sat out on a deer stand one morning sitting on a, on, on a, a, a dozer pile of wood sitting there and I opened my Bible to Ecclesiastes and the first thing it says is the words of the preacher and the, and the, and the P was capitalized and it just hit me. <gasps> the preacher's not me. The preacher's Jesus. Amen. 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 Behold this I found. Said the, so the preacher's going to tell you something tonight. This have I found. Meaning wisdom. I found wisdom counting one by one to find out the account. So here we are in the 666th chapter of the Bible, and we see Solomon seeking out wisdom, and the preacher tells us that if you want to know wisdom, count one by one to find out the account. Count things. Now, out of the mouth of one witness, we're not to buy it. We're not to believe it. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So is there a second witness to this? I bet you there is, but I'm not a betting man, but I would bet you 50 bucks that there is. And you'd lose the bet because, turn to Revelation 13. By the way, has anybody got 50 bucks? I need a loan. Revelation 13, look at verse 18. Here is what? Wisdom. Wisdom. 
Let him that hath understanding do what? Count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. Now here's what's interesting. And you might ask me this question in a little bit. Notice that the number is both of a beast and a man. Not one or the other. That, that might confuse you a little bit. And it kind of did me at first. But then I started catching it. And I, and I might explain that in a little bit. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So now we have two witnesses. One Old Testament, one New Testament. Both of them are associated with the exact same number, 666. And both verses, both places tell us that there is wisdom and understanding that comes with counting the numbers. So we're going to count some numbers tonight. Does that sound interesting to you? Who in here has ever studied any numbers in the Bible? Raise your hand. Brother Ernie, I know you have. Anybody else? What, was you just waiting for me to show up here? <laughs> give me a number. Somebody give me a number. Who said, well, seven is what I have coming up here in a minute. So hold your hat, all right? You win the 50 bucks. No, I don't I'm not giving you 50 bucks. Who said 12? Let's go. Turn to Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Now, I'm in, the, I'm in the midst, actually, of revising my study of the number 12. And I'm not... 100% prepared, but I, I will give you a few things just from Scripture. I don't have the Scripture in front of me, but I will give you a few things from Scripture. Here's one thing God showed me. <coughs> he said, Mike, the, num the number meaning is in the Genesis chapter. Now, the Bible says test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Because many false spirits, many false prophets are out there. <coughs> And what went through my head could be a lie. So I'm going to test that. So I went to Genesis 1. The number 1, obviously, God is 1. The number 1 is the beginning number. It's the first number. So it represents the beginning. It re represents the first things. So in the first verse of the first chapter of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? And so that's the meaning of the number one. It stands for unity. It's that for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And yet this, these three are what? Behold, the Lord our God is, and his name is. You see that? What's the number two mean? Division and unity. And what do you have in Genesis chapter two? You have the story of a man... And God says it is not good that the man should be alone. He's single. So God says, I will make an help meet for him. And he takes the rib out of Adam, forms the woman, brings the woman to him. And Adam says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she came out of the man. And the two shall be one flesh. Isn't that amazing? That's the meaning of the number two in the Bible. Plus, there's a, an additional meaning that has to do with the age and the time of the Gentiles. How many years has it been since Christ came down the earth the first time? 2,000 years. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. There's another witness to that verse in the book of Psalms. David said, for as a, 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 a thousand years in thy sight are as but yesterday. So there's two witnesses to that idea. And it's been two days since Christ came the first time. And when he comes the second time, he is going to join with his bride, the church. Somebody say amen. Because what did Paul say? Paul quoted Genesis chapter 2 in Ephesians 5. He said, behold, this is a great mystery. When he was talking about, therefore, the two shall be one flesh. He said, this is a great mystery. But I speak of Christ and the church. And the two are going to become one one of these days. Wow. 
By the way, what happened on the second day of creation? God divided the waters here from the waters here. He divided them. Now there's two sets of waters. You'll see that on day two. What did God do on day three of creation? What did God do on day three? Who reads their Bible? What did he do on day three of creation? What did he say? Leaves? Trees? I like you all. Can I take you back to Missouri with me? He knew that. This boy is going to embarrass you guys. God created all the fruit bearing trees. How many parts are there to a seed? Those of you that have ever planted or held a seed in your hand, how many parts are there to it? It's three. The outer shell, which is this flesh. How many parts are there to us? Three. Spirit, soul, and body. And this is the shell that when we plant it in the ground, it rots off and the new body comes up out of it. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. So now let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And what do we have in Genesis chapter 3? We have a tree that God commanded in Genesis 2 that Adam should not eat from it. Who shows up in Genesis chapter 3? The serpent. And what did he tell Eve? Thou, thou, shalt, thou shalt not surely die. For God doth know in the day that thou eatest, thou sh shalt be as gods, knowing good and evil. And what did she do? She took the fruit and on day three was when all the fruit-bearing trees and the seed-bearing trees were created and made. And she took the fruit. And she saw three things. Three things came out of her in Genesis 3, 6. When she saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. And when she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And then she saw that it was desired to make one wise, the pride of life. James said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's part of the world. That's the three types of sins that there are. How many, how many sons did Adam have? He had Cain, and then he had Abel, right? Abel was killed. So now there has to be a replacement. Who was the replacement? Seth. Seth. Seth is the third son of Adam. Seth is who all of us came from. Because from the line of Seth, the third son, we go all the way down to Noah. And Noah had how many sons? And how many of us have come from one or two or three of those three sons? Everybody here. And all of us, and it doesn't matter if you're white, black, pale, yellow, red, black. I don't care what color you are, what nationality you came from, what nation you came from. You are a sinner. You've got lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life in you. And you got it from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So now we move down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Were they all sinners? Yes. Now, who was the third born son of Jacob? Well, if I gave out 50 bucks to everybody to answer the question, I wouldn't give out 50 bucks tonight except for that kid right there. Who was the third born son? Of... There was Reuben, Simeon, Levi. What's the third book of the Bible? Leviticus, and it's named after who? And what does Leviticus deal with? The priesthood for what reason? The price of sin. That's what the priesthood was for. It was to kill animals to pay for everybody's sins for a day and then for a year. You know how many chapters Leviticus has in it? 27. That's 3 times 3 times 3. That's the same number of books that are in the New Testament, by the way. Isn't that something? So then we get to Jesus, who was how old when he went to the cross to be 
the Levitical sacrifice for all of man's sins. 33. And how many pieces of silver was he sold for? 30. And how many crosses were on Golgotha? Because he was numbered with the transgressors. Am I the only one get am I, am, I, am I the only one happy tonight? Four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The gospel. And in Genesis chapter four, Cain, who is of the wicked one, he represents Satan. And who did he kill? Abel, whose sacrifice was accepted by God. Abel is a type of Christ. You have the gospel story in Genesis chapter 4. The number 5 is the number for death. It took me a while to get there. But it's the number for death. And I don't have a lot of time to, to get into that tonight. But if you go to Genesis 5 and you count Adam's name, he'll be in there five times. And the fifth time it'll say, and Adam died. And then Adam's son, Seth, you count his name, it'll be in there five times. And it'll say, and Seth died. And then Seth had a son, and his name is in there five times. And the fifth time it mentioned it, he died. And then his son is mentioned five times, and it goes all the way down. Enoch breaks the line. He breaks the pattern because he's translated up into heaven. Okay? And guess who else breaks the pattern? Noah. Because the fifth time Noah is mentioned, it says, Noah found in the eyes of the Lord. And instead of dying, he lived when everybody else died. In fact, he was taken up, wasn't he? So watch this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. We conquer death. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. In 1 Corinthians 15, the pattern is still there. Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. That's the fifth time the word mystery is mentioned in the Bible. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Both verses that talk about the rapture have that same pattern in it, but only in a King James Bible. Uh... So are you figuring out that the number meaning is in the Genesis chapter? So let's go to Genesis. I'm going to skip the rest of it. Uh, we brought videos on numbers, okay? And they're all free, by the way. I'm a non-profit prophet, I guess, something like that. Not for profit. Let's look in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. What, what is that land really? What really is the promised land? Heaven. What is our promised land? We're Gentiles. We're not Jews. We don't, we don't get anything. What is our promised land? It's heaven. And when we get to heaven, what are we going to see? A holy city. And how many gates does heaven have? New, holy Jerusalem. How many? Twelve. How many foundations does it have? Twelve. How many tribes were there? How many apostles? And we're all going to the same place. We're all going to the holy city, New Jerusalem. How many months are there in a year? That's because every month there's a different set of stars in the sky, isn't there? You can't, I, I, I don't know too many constellations. I know Orion. I know the Big Dipper. I know you can't find Orion in the summertime. You can find him in the wintertime. That's because he moves. Month to month, there is a new set of stars in the sky. And God told Abraham that your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. So watch this. Turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Oh, you're going to love this. You're going to look up in the sky. You're going to see something different. How many of y'all believe the Bible? Say amen. amen. 
You don't believe, we, you don't believe it took 13.5 billion years to create everything, did you? I didn't think so. Six days. And it didn't have to take six days, did it? But everything God does is in order. Everything. What's going to happen September 21st? Thank you. Do you all have fall in Arkansas? Yeah, sometimes. I, yeah, I forget. But it's the same day in Missouri. It's the same day in England. It's the same day in Africa. And it's the same day in Russia and China, isn't it? September 21st is the same day all over the world called the autumnal equinox. It is when there are exactly 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night in every place in the world. The spring equinox, they call it the equinox because it's equal, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. But then you have, yeah, thank you, 12 hours in the day. Je Jesus said that in John 11, are there not 12 hours in the day? And he was saying something with that number, okay? So let's look at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Who loves to look at the stars at night? Somebody say Amen. You love to see the, the um, I love, I like being out in Oklahoma. I did. I like being out in Oklahoma for a couple years because it's flat and you can see the sunset. Okay. In the Ozarks, it's iffy because we got too many hills and trees. Amen. Day and the day utter a speech and night and the night shows knowledge. 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's, and what did I just say? September 21st is the autumnal equinox in every place on the planet. December 21st is the winter solstice. Uh, April 21st is the spring, or March. March 21st, spring equinox. And then June 21st is the summer solstice. It's that way every place on the planet. Now look at verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath, in them, now watch this. In the heavens hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. When God told Moses to build the tabernacle, he built it exactly the way God told him. He, God even showed him the one in heaven and said, build it exactly this way. And Moses had to build the entry to the tabernacle facing east. No matter where they went, no matter where they traveled to, when they put the tabernacle together, the door was always facing east. The most holy place was always in the west. Now, which way does the sun go? So the heavens are a tabernacle and the sun goes the exact same direction that the high priest does when he walks into the courtyard and then into the sanctuary and then into the most holy place every year on the Day of Atonement. Wow. He's going the same direction as the sun. And who is the sun, by the way? He's the son of righteousness who will arise with healing in his wings. In Matthew chapter 17, he was on, transfigured on the mountaintop and his face shone as the sun. In John cha Revelation chapter 1, John heard a voice behind him. He turned around and Jesus' face was shining like the sun. So who is the sun here in Psalm 19, 4? It's Jesus, the sun, going through the tabernacle of the heavens. Is there a tabernacle in heaven? Amen. Yes. Now watch this. So Moses put the tabernacle down. And then did the tribes of Israel just get to park anywhere they wanted to? There was an order to. And God said, do it this way. Judah was always to the east. Dan was always to the north. I, I don't remember how the other ones were. But there was three tribes to the east, three to the south, three to the west, and three to the north. So watch this. Just like the sun goes from east to west in the heavens. And by the way, during the daytime, do the stars, are the stars still there during the daytime? We just can't see them. Why? Because the sun's brighter than the stars are. Amen. 
You know what that means? We're the stars. Christ is a whole lot smarter than us. Amen. Let's let him be that way. This book is a whole lot smarter than I am. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. I don't know why you came. Anyway, so in the, in the tabernacle and in the wilderness camp, you had a picture of the heavens. You had the tabernacle in the middle, east to west, and the, each tribe as the stars of heaven each month with a different set of stars up in the night sky. And God planted them that way because he wanted them to know, I'm serious, I'm going to make you as the stars of heaven. Twelve months. Does that answer your question about the number twelve? Okay. Give me another number. Eight. What chapter are we going to turn to? Genesis 8. Why aren't you there yet? You waiting on me? What do you think eight means? Eight. Don't tell him. Was you listening? What do you think eight means? I'll just sit down and let your wife come up here. <laughs> How many days are there in a week? Seven. And then does time stop? It goes, starts over again, doesn't it? So the first day of the week is actually the eighth day of the previous week. Saturday is the Sabbath, it's the seventh day. And what day did Jesus rise from the grave? First day of the week. So, eight, based on that alone, eight is the number for new life, resurrection. Now, if you look back in Genesis 7, which we're going to do in a minute, in Genesis 7, God ended the world. And how many people were on the ark? Eight. Noah, his wife, his three sons, their three wives. So, after the flood in Genesis 7, where God ended the world, what did he do in Genesis 8? Verse 2, the fountains of the deep also, the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. God stopped the water. And we, we have the story of the dove and him sending it out. And in verse 15, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. How many people got off of the ark? Eight people walked out into a new world in the eighth chapter of the Bible. To start the world all over again. Now how many years has it been since the creation? 6,000 years. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. The day of the Lord is going to be the Sabbath. That's when Jesus is going to come down. Revelation 19. And he's going to destroy all of his enemies. He's going to put Satan in the bottomless pit. Amen. 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 Because the devil messes with kids. And I hate him. I hate him. And an angel's going to put the devil down in the pit for how long? That's a day. And Christ is going to reign for how long? That's a day. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. It's going to be the seventh day. The Sabbath day. The day of rest. When Christ puts down all the enemies and all of the swords are beat into plowshares and there's no more war and there's no more famine and we don't have any more crooked politicians because Christ is going to come with ten thousands of his saints. I believe that's us and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Amen. And then after that, 
God ends everything. Second Peter talked about everything's going to be burned up in a fire. And thus starts the eighth day. And in the eighth day, it's going to be everlasting. It's going to be a new world, a new heaven, and a new earth. And do you know how many times God put that in the Bible? A new heaven, a new earth? Eight times. Eight times. Isn't that sweet? So, on what day did they circumcise the child? Why? Because the circumcision represented taking away the flesh. And all of us are going to be circumcised. Our flesh is coming off and we're going to glory. And we're not coming back. We're not going to have this body anymore. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the number eight. All right. Now, look up on the screen. I'm going to move through this very slowly. Because I don't care what kind of time I get up in the morning. God is not the author of confusion, is he? What does an author do? Writes books. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God is not the author of confusion. So that means that our Bible is in order. Every book is in the exact right place. Every verse is exactly where God wanted it to be. Every chapter, every phrase, everything is exactly where God wants it because God always does things in order. That's why I brought up September 21st is because every year it's the same thing. September 21st, September 21st, September 21st. Every year for the past 6,000 years, it's been that way. God does everything in order. Uh, he's not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So if you've got disorder in your church, pastor, something ain't right. There's a spirit somewhere, like a lion roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. When confusion hits, you know you've got a spirit. Okay? I have had them on me, especially when I go to Kenya. I can tell you all about it. Don't have time. Let's study the number seven. You can open your Bible to Genesis chapter two. What did God do on the seventh day? See, this is very simple. The Bible actually tells you the meaning of the numbers. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to trust me on it. I mean, I've studied it. I've written books on it, written two books on it. I've got videos on it. Um... I'm still working on I'm still working on studying the numbers. Like I said, I wasn't done with the number 12. I thought it was, but I'm not. There's more to it. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Notice I underlined the, the key words, finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, underlined, God ended. So that's part of the meaning. He ended it. His work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day, that's another part of it, from all his work which he had made, and God blessed. Now here's another meaning of the number seven. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. means he made it holy. So that's another meaning of it. Because that in, in, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So now what I'm going to do one day, God opened my eyes. I had this old computer software that counted, gave exact counts of words and phrases in the Bible. And now our ministry, a lady wrote software just for our ministry. You can do the same thing that I'm teaching you tonight. You can do the same thing with it. I thought that the phrase Word of God, because the Word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and one of the books I had said the number 50 was the number for the Holy Spirit because the Spirit came on the Pentecost, which is 50th day. So I typed in the phrase Word of God. That's the Bible. And it didn't come up 50 times. I thought, So I kind of laid back a little bit. You know what, how us preachers do, we meditate. 
on the word. And about 20 minutes later, I woke up, I went. It wasn't 50 times, it was 49 times. Seven times seven. And I went, whoa. That's either an anomaly, which means it's not really part of what the Bible is, or there's more. Well, guess what? There's a lot more. So I started thinking of things that would be related to what the number seven meant and started searching those phrases in the Bible. And I was going, let me show you. Number seven is the number for completion for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. What, what, what Genesis chapter was that? Genesis 7. And how many days did God say he was going to destroy the earth? He told Noah seven days. I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to cause it to rain. I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to end everything. Completion. Number seven is completion. Then, Genesis 29, fulfill her week. This is when uh, Jacob is supposed to marry Rachel, but he, but he gets the ugly sister instead. Leah, right? And he worked how many years for Rachel? Seven years. And the Bible says fulfill her week. So he spent seven days with the ugly sister so he could get the pretty one. Then he had to work seven more years. The word week or weeks is found exactly 28 times in the King James Bible, which is seven times four. And how many days are there in a week? Seven. That's making, the, I've known this for years and it's making the stuff go, doodads go up on the back of my head again. I love talking about this. Deuteronomy 16, seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. How long is seven weeks? 49 days. Seven times seven, 49. I'm going to do this. Turn to the 490th chapter of the Bible. Go, come on. Uh, the software will do this for you. Turn to Psalm 12. Turn to Psalm 12. Because I don't think I'm going to put it up on the screen until you turn there. I don't know when it's going to come up in my notes. That's why I'm saying let's do it now. Let's have some fun. What's in the 490th chapter? That's 70 times 7, isn't it? How often did Jesus forgive our sins? Till 70 times 7. 490th chapter of the Bible is Psalm 12. Look in verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. How many of you believe that? Amen. You believe there's any mistakes in the Bible? No. As silver tried in the furnace of earth purified. Do you know when King James of England commanded, made the commandment? To have the Anglican bishops and the Puritan pastors and all the divines and scholars of England to get together and begin translating a new Bible? 1604. Do you know when that Bible came out? 1611. How many years is that? It's purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation for how long? So do you believe that right now you have every single word of God and that it's pure? And that's the 490th chapter of the Bible, 70 times 7. I saw that and I went, I do that a lot. In Daniel chapter 9, what did he say? 70 weeks. How long is 70 weeks? We just said it. 400, it's 400, it's 70 times 7. 490 days, which is 70 times 7. We went to the 490th chapter of the Bible. and We found that God purified his word seven times as silver tried as, as in a furnace of earth. You know what he said to Israel? I'm going to try you as silver. I'm going to get the dross out of you. I'm going to clean you up. And you're going to be pure. How pure is the gold in heaven? It's so pure, you can see through it. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. The word finished is found exactly 42 times in the King James Bible. 7 times 6. 
And the seventh day, God ended his work in which he had made it, and he rested on the seventh day. The word rested is found 21 times. That's seven times three. The phrase seventh day and seventh month together is mentioned exactly 77 times in the Old Testament. And they're all associated with the number seven. Exodus 16, 26. He mentioned the Sabbath in that verse. The word Sabbath is mentioned 77 times in the Old Testament. And the Sabbath is what day? The seventh day. God speaks in order, doesn't he? Am I going too fast for you? Good. I hope so. Notice this. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of seven years. Seven times seven years. How many years is that? Yeah. Seven, the phrase seven times is mentioned 35 times in the Bible. Seven times five. The phrase seven years is mentioned 42 times in the Bible. Seven times six. When you add 35 and 42, you get 77. At naturally. Because they're both products of seven. Isn't that something? That God put this in the Bible. In your Bible. This is why I don't let NIV preachers come to my church. I know this now. I know this Bible is pure. I know it's right. For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain. The phrase seven days is mentioned exactly 98 times in the Bible. That's seven times seven times two. Or 49 times two. However you want to do the math, do the math. 98 times the phrase seven days is in your Bible. It's all based on the number seven. That is cool. One guy gets it. And a good looking young man. Look at this. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. That's ending things. The word cease is mentioned 70 times in the Bible. The word finished is mentioned 42 times in the Bible. The word perfectly is mentioned seven times in the Bible. Because when God does things, he does it perfectly. And it's mentioned seven times in the Bible. Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto where? The end of the world. And that phrase, the end of the world, is mentioned exactly seven times. What did I tell you about the eighth day? God's going to end the world after the seventh day. And we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem on the eighth day. And the phrase, end of the world, is mentioned exactly seven times in your Bible. Whew. Look at here. Ends of the earth. The phrase, ends of the earth. Acts 13, 47. The, end, the phrase, ends of the earth, mentioned 28 times. That's seven times four. Mm. We have sevens all in Revelation, don't we? I mean, that's, that's God saying it means something. This is how I'm going to do it. So we have the seven seals. There's a book in God's right, right hand sealed with seven seals. And only Christ is worthy to take that book and open up the seals. And he does. Then we have the seven trumpets. Then we have the seven angels who have the seven vials with the seven last plagues in it. And you have sevens all through the book of Revelation. That's because when God does this thing in Revelation, it's going to be over with. Because the book of... And where in the Bible is the book of Revelation? But where? It's the last book of the Bible. He starts out with the first book of the Bible telling you the beginning. Then he ends up in the last book of the Bible telling you the end. God knows how to write, doesn't he? Amen. I wish the world could read the King James Bible. Let me tell you what I did in Kenya. Turn to Daniel 3. We were, I was with Mike Hutzel. And we were preaching out in village I had never heard of. Kilimabogo. But he had been invited out there. So he called me and asked me if I wanted to go. And I said, yeah. Me and my son-in-law, Michael, who is from Kenya. Um, we went out. This, this village is about two hours east of um, Nairobi. So we were staying in Nairobi at night, driving two hours to Kilimambogo. And they had several pastors and it was multiple churches there. But Pastor Colonzo, just a, a godly man, godly man. And us different pastors had different things we were teaching. And Mike asked me to teach on the King James Bible. Because in Kenya, let me tell you what God did for the Kenyans. 
when the British colonized, they colonized East Africa. Kenya was one of their colonies. They became independent back in the 60s. And uh, their government's so corrupt. But anyway, so all of the Kenyans can read English. Some of them, most of them can speak it. Most of the signage in Kenya is in English. And they all take their tea like British people. And they all play cricket. And they play what they call football, which is soccer. And they all act like British people. Because the British colonized them. Now think of what God did. God sent, Briti sent British ships, brought tea, brought football, brought cricket, and brought the English language. And brought the King James Bible. So I checked the Swahili Bible. In Daniel 3.25... Uh, Daniel 3 who is it in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who does it say? The Son of God. The Son of God. Did you know what the NIV says here? A Son of the Gods. You know what the New American Standard says? A Son of the Gods. You know what the Holman Standard Bible says? A Son of the Gods. Plural. That's not what it says. Who was in there? The Son of God. The Son of God. And you think Nebuchadnezzar knew who he was? Guarantee you he did. So I checked the Swahili Bible. And I, I set them up all week. And one day, I got up and I said, I learned some Swahili last night. And they got excited. And I said, Mwana wa mungu. I, I said, did I say it right? And they said, yeah. I said, that means what? They said, Son of God. Mwana is Son Wa is of, and Mungu is God. So I said, Jesus is Moana wa Mungu. And they said, Amen. And I said, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is Moana wa Miungu. And they went, No, 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 no. I said, What did I just, and I was playing with them, I knew what I said. Moana wa Miungu means son of the gods, plural. See, they put a Y in the word. That pluralizes it in Swahili. And they said, no, 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 that's wrong. That's son of gods. And I said, who was in the fiery furnace? And they said, Muano Amungu. I said, open up your Swahili Bible to Daniel 3.25. And when they did, you heard gasps all over the room. <gasps> because it said, Muano Amiyungu. And people were crying. And Pastor Colonzo stood up. And I thought, oh no, I am in trouble. He said, I've heard enough! Oh, call the UN. Get me out of here. He said, I realize I've been preaching out of a book for 20 years, but I've not been preaching out of the Word of God. And my cuts will just happen. We, we made provisions. We brought probably three, 400 Bibles there, King James Bibles. And we didn't have enough Bibles to give out. Because God taught those people to read the king's English. And they know the word of God now. In Kilimambogo, Kenya. This is the phrase right here that got me the most high. 49 times, 7 times. So, well, actually, the word of God. But the phrase, most high. And who is the most high? Now watch this. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Who said that? Satan, Satan Lucifer. Who did he say he was going to be like? Buddha? He's already Buddha. Did he say he's going to be like Mohammed? He's already Mohammed. Who did he say he's going to be like? The most high God. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You watch out. You better know this Bible. How many of you could tell a counterfeit $100 bill if you had one? You can? God bless you. Okay?
because most people can't, and apparently most people can't tell they got a counterfeit Bible in their hand. Psalm 16, 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. The phrase Holy One is only mentioned 48 times in the Bible. However, Isaiah 57, 15 talks about, For thus saith the high and lofty one, capitalized, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. So we still have his name, Holy One, and it's in there 49 times, 7 times 7. So the Most High, 7 times 7. Word of God, 7 times 7. Um, holy one, seven times seven, 49 times. Angel of the Lord. Who was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Jesus Christ. 56 times in the Old Testament, seven times nine. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the phrase God of Israel, 203 times, seven times 29. Lord God, 546 times, seven times 78. They're all multiples of seven, every one of them. God Almighty. 11 times, Almighty God, 3 times, that's 14 times total, 7 times 2. King of kings and Lord of lords, how many words are capitalized there? 7 words in your King James Bible. They got it right, didn't they? Sure they did. In the beginning, God, the word God with a capital G, 4,081 times, which is a perfect multiple of the number 7 in your King James Bible. Now, how could man do that? Man can't, those men couldn't do it. We're talking 400, over 400 years ago. They didn't have calculators. They didn't say, we need to put the word God in here a multiple of seven times so we make it look... They didn't know what they were doing. The Holy Ghost was guiding them. Amen. Do not interpretations belong to God is what Joseph said. The phrase works of God seven times. The phrase power of God 14 times, seven times two. The Mount of God, four times. Mountain of God, three times. Total, seven times. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. The word husbandman, seven times in the Bible. By the way, you have the true vine in your hand right now. I am the true vine. He that abideth, if ye you, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. You, do you still believe that? I do. The generations of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. From Abraham to David, 14 generations, 7 times 2. From David until the carrying away of Babylon, 14 generations. And from carrying away into Babylon unto Christ, 14 generations. That's 42 total, 7 times 6. Now there's another lineage of Christ in Luke chapter 3. And starting with Christ, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. It goes backwards which was the son of Heli, and then it goes all the way down, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam is a type of Christ. He was the son of God in the Old Testament. And you have 77 names from Jesus all the way back to God. Mm. So guess what? Now what does a lineage do? Who in here has got a will? Okay, so when you die, somebody's going to get your junk. Amen? Amen. You got sons and daughters? Okay, they're the rightful heirs. I mean, how, how did King Charles get picked to be the king of England now? He's the rightful heir. It goes, it's a lineage that goes all the way back. A thousand years or more. Okay. So the lineage of Christ means something. In, in Matthew, it's counted from Abraham to Christ. But in Luke, it's counted from Jesus all the way back to God. Now, what does the lineage prove? It proves who the rightful heir is. And is Jesus the rightful heir of God? Yes. Does Jesus inherit all things? Yes. Who else inherits all things? His church. We are joint heirs with Christ, aren't we? That's what it says, isn't it? So, does it amaze you that the word church is mentioned 77 times in the King James Bible? Same number of names in the lineage from Jesus to God in Luke chapter 3. We are joint heirs. This Bible is perfect. It's absolutely 
Look at the 77th verse of the Bible, Genesis 3, 21. And, uh, and to Adam also and, and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. That's the 77th verse of the Bible. The 77th place you find the word church is the Laodicean church. And what's wrong with the Laodicean church? They're naked, just like Adam and Eve was. And what did Christ do? He said, I, I counsel thee to buy of me that thou, uh, right raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Because Jesus himself is going to clothe his bride, isn't he? Turn to, um, let's get some doctrine. Turn to Revelation 19. Are we saved by works? Anybody here saved by works? Good. Who's wanting to go home and watch Matlock? All right. Or uh, Gunsmoke. About the only channel I watched, we, we got rid of we got rid of DirecTV, we got rid of it because we had a house fire, we got rid of everything. And I quit, I even quit watching the news. I quit watching news after the election. I gave it up, I'm going, they're lying through their teeth anyway, I don't believe a word they say, I don't care if it's Fox, I don't care who it is, they're lying through their teeth. So when I wake up in the morning, I turn on a channel on Roku, it's 24 hours of Bob Barker, The Price is Right. Yeah, it was. I'm going, wow, he won a car. And there were only $7,000 back then. What did I tell you? Uh, Revelation 19. I'm going to show you the difference between the King James and the other Bibles. Um, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself. Who's the, who's the lamb is Christ. His wife is the church. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, where do we get our righteousness from? Don't we get them by tithing, church attendance, Bible reading, witnessing? Don't we, don't we earn righteousness by doing we? Works of righteousness are what? Filthy rags in God's sight. Now your King James Bible has this verse right. It says the fine linen that the church is granted to wear is the righteousness of saints Given to her by Christ. Christ adorns his own bride. Amen. You know what the NIV and every other modern English translation says in this verse. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Wow. That doctrine is straight from hell. It's not of God. So, I'm not even going to get into that. 77th chapter of the Bible is Exodus 27. And that's where God built the tabernacle of the congregation. And that phrase is mentioned 21 times in Exodus. That's 7 times 3. It's mentioned 133 times in the whole Bible. That's 7 times 19. Tabernacle of the congregation. If you're even Christ, our Passover, the word Passover or Passovers, 77 times. Because the church, for the church, our Passover is already over with, isn't it? Do we have to still keep the Passover? No, Christ is our Passover. It's, it's done. When he said it is finished, he wasn't kidding, was he? By the way, he said seven things from the cross, didn't he? And the last thing he said was it is finished. Isn't that something? Romans 6. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The, the forms, all the forms of the word baptize. Baptize, baptize, baptizes, baptizeth, baptizing, 77 times. Wow. The lineage, 77. The church, 77. The Passovers, 77 times. All the forms of the word baptize, 77 times. In this one Bible. I looked in the others, it's, it's completely messed up. The phrase, in Christ, 77 times. If any man be, now you asked about the number eight. 
Where was the eight people? In the, who is the ark? The ark was Christ. And if any man be in the ark, in Christ, they are, they come out in Genesis 8. Eight people come out in Genesis 8, a new creation. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Woo! I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Jesus appointed 70. Why that number? Because the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of gods is mentioned 70 times. And he went out and told him to tell him the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. In fact, the word king with a capital K exactly 70 times. And who is that king? It's Jesus Christ. That's seven times 10. 10 is the number for dominion. How many commandments? 10. And in Romans 7, Paul said... Uh, know ye not that a man is under the law so long as he liveth? He's, we are under the dominion of the law in our flesh. As long as our flesh is alive, it's under the dominion of the law. That's why it has to be killed. Because it's the one that sins. The new man in us doesn't sin. How many of you believe that? Say amen. That cannot sin because it was given to us by God our Father. It was seeded into us. By the perfect word of God. If God is perfect, his word must be perfect. Because God never lies. It's a perfect word. I showed you the 490th chapter of the Bible. The phrase word of the Lord is 245 times in the Old Testament. 7 times 7 times 5. The phrase Lord of hosts, 245 times. Same amount of times. 245. Now I'm getting to the good stuff. Faith. Faith is 245 times in the New Testament. Faith is... Come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Thy word, that phrase, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The phrase, thy word, seven times in the New Testament. Thus saith the Lord host of God of Israel. Thus saith the Lord of hosts is 70 times exactly in the King James. God spake all these words saying, that's exactly seven words. And then you have the Ten Commandments. By the way, the Ten Commandments are in the 70th chapter of the Bible. 50 chapters in Genesis, Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. And that's seven times what? Ten for the commandments. Seven because they're perfect, weren't they? They were written by God. And that's in the 70th chapter of the Bible. I usually start out with that one. I always tell people, turn to the 70th chapter of the Bible. And they go, I'm going, it's easy. Genesis has 50 chapters. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word? Yeah. Did you know the phrase, the word, capital W, seven times in the King James Bible? Except, 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That verse is missing out of every single modern translation of the Bible in any language. That verse is gone. They took it out. So now what happens to the pattern of thy word or the word? Ruins it, doesn't it? And by the way, there is no other better verse than 1 John 5, 7 to tell us that the three are one. There is not a better verse anywhere in the Bible. You cannot prove the Godhead is one without 1 John 5, 7. You can't do it. That verse has to be there. The phrase Word of God, 49 times, I mentioned that. King of kings, Lord of lords, seven, seven words. Faith, 245 times, that's 49 times five. Word of God, 49 times. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The gospel of God, that phrase, seven times. The word message, seven times in the Bible. The Lord's message. Seven thunders. Thunders mentioned seven times in the Bible, and there are seven thunders in the book of Revelation. The word thunder, it's the voice of God. In John 12, 28, I'm moving through some of this stuff. This is where we're going. Oh, what did I just squirt out? Oh, good. Because I think I touched an NIV earlier today. <laughs> Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. So, the word Jesus. Now, there's... It's actually 983 times. I'm going to be honest with you. 
but one of them refers to Joshua. One of them refers to Jesus' justice. And the other one refers to another Jesus. So with those three gone, you have 980 times. That is 70 times 7 times 2. Man didn't do that. And you know what it, you know what it means to me? See, I believe, I believe God's going to save Israel. In Revelation 7, he seals them, doesn't he? All 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. That's that number 12. And the seal is the Holy Ghost. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know how many times the phrase Holy Spirit's in your King James Bible? Seven times exactly. And how many candles were there on the candlestick that represented the Holy Spirit in the tabernacle? Seven. You know how many decorations? You know that the candlestick in the tabernacle was to look like an almond tree. So it had, a, it had a three decorations, uh, like a, a knob, a flower, and a bud. Maybe I'm getting those wrong. There's three decorations on the outer pipes. Three sets of three decorations on the three outer pipes. And on the middle pipe, the seventh one, there was four sets of decorations. Three things apiece. So the total sum of decorations on the candlestick in the tabernacle was exactly 66. How many books are in your Bible? What is the only light allowed in this church? The word of God. Thy word is a and a light. Isn't it something that God put 66 decorations on the candlestick some 4,000 years ago prophesying that there would be exactly 66 books in our Bible? And we think man came up with that? Not a chance. The phrase son, okay. So the phrase son of man is mentioned exactly 196 times. That's 7 times 7 times 4. Son of man. Who is the son of man? Jesus Christ. The name Jesus Christ is also found 196 times in the King James Bible. 7 times 7 times 4. The word book or books, where is it? Did I lose it? There's the phrase Holy Spirit seven times. There's a book sealed with seven seals. So we have the phrase Son of Man 196 times, Jesus Christ 196 times, and the word book or books 196 times. And the book is Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. He is the Son of Man. He is perfect, and our Bible is perfect too. Do you now believe that? Do you believe? Do you trust me? Don't do it. But do you believe now what the numbers bear out? And I can do this literally with every number that I've given you tonight. The number one, the number two, number three, number four, number five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, twenty-two, thirty-three, sixty-six. I can do that with literally all those numbers I just mentioned. I can show you patterns after pattern after pattern after pattern in this one Bible. In fact, I'll give you a fun one. And then we'll close. You know how many teeth a human adult has? Who said? Thir 32. How do we speak? We use our teeth. Whether you grew them or bought them. Amen? We used to have an old supply place by where I grew up called Kohler City Ply, Supply, and they had a barrel full of false teeth, and people would go in and try the false teeth on out of that barrel. That's the way they did it. So how do we speak? We use the 32 teeth, and what's the number now? 33. And this is how we make our words, isn't it? But if we have two witnesses who are both saying the same thing, what is that number now? 66.
I can do this all night. I can bore you to tears with this all night. You know how many bones you have in your spine? 33. Which means, and I'm going to keep this part simple, which means you have a bundle of nerves coming out of one side, the left side, and a bundle of nerves coming out of the other side. How many bundles of nerves is that? 33 times 2 is how many? And that's how the brain talks to the body. And who's the head? It's Christ. And who's the body? We are. And this is how he speaks to us. And this is the only way he speaks to us. Amen? Father, bless your word tonight. Lord, I've had more fun. I could do this. I wish I could do this in every church in America. And I still get goosebumps. I still get joy out of showing these numbers. And God, I know what you brought me out of. I know the pit you dug me out of. To show me this. I'll never get over it. Never. So Father, I praise your name. I thank you. Let every song I sing, every word I speak, bring praise and glory and honor to the Son of God, the King of Kings, and to the Word of God, which you have magnified even above your name. So bless this holy book, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Pastor, I'll